Welcome, everyone, to another edition of Night Journey Rewind, the podcast. I'm your host. My name is James Graves. Man, I'm so excited. I saw this gentleman play with, I call a trumpetee, Skylar Tang. And I said, oh, man, we've got to talk. So we've got, this is a very busy man. I'm so happy that he was able to take the time out so we could just sit down and talk. He's a spy player. His name is Dylan Vado. Welcome to the show, Dylan. Thank you for coming up. Hey, thank you, James. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me. I'm glad to be here. Let's take it from the beginning. Right. Xylophone, how did it start for you? Yeah, all right. Um, the beginning of my musical journey started with drums, actually. And um, and to this day, I'm still uh, definitely an active drummer. It's kind of like, at this point, I'm playing sort of 50-50 drums and vibraphone. People often ask what my main instrument is. and I can't really say, you know, like it, it really, I play them both so equally. Um, but I did start on the drums when I was a little kid. Um, and there was a close family friend named Chris, Hask uh, Chris Haskett, who, um, a close friend of my dad's, who was a great drummer. And we used to go see him and his friends play at this little bar and grill, like kind of divey place called The Cats, which is just off of corner of highway 17 like right, right where um, san jose runs into the mountains before right. it goes to santa cruz um and yeah once a month they just played like jazz standards and the guitarist sweeney had some original tunes that they rehearsed and learned too but they played mostly just standards and stuff but i had never heard anything like it because i was like seven or eight years old you know and i would sit like this close to the drums and just like i want to do that so chris started showing me long story short I play the drums and uh, I didn't even really know what jazz was or what that, you know, that word didn't really mean anything to me for a long time. That was just my access point to live music. So I just saw it as this is just like what people do when they play. It wasn't until later I learned like, oh, that's like a really particular style or something, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, when you're a kid, everything's new to you, you know, and it's just right at you. So yeah, I, I just grew up really fascinated by the drums and by rhythm and also just by, I would say, live music in general and bands playing together and, and you know, creating sort of a, a heat source and a resonance on stage that you could feel palpably. Um, that, that's what originally drew me to the music and that's what keeps me slogging forward and keep, you know, <laughs> keeping going <laughs> against all odds. <laughs> Um, so you said you were kind of really, the music that you listened to, when you, especially when you started playing drums, was jazz music, or was it just all types of music, or was emphasis on jazz? Well, I was, I was first exposed to live music through those people playing jazz, mm -hmm. and they, it was funny, they actually had a little demo, like a like burned CD that they made to submit to restaurants, so you could get like more casual gigs. But it was them playing those songs I heard all the time, and, and I loved it. So I I got a copy of their little like restaurant gig demo, mm -hmm. and I had a little CD player, and I would listen to it all the time. And then Chris found out I was just listening to that all the time. He was like, oh, no, 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 we can't have this. And he was like, here's Clifford Brown. <laughs> here's Miles Davis. Here's, he's like, you need oh, to listen okay. to some, like, right, real right. jazz, kid. You know, you can't just be listening to us. They were great, though. I mean, like, like they were, they were not like hack amateur players. They were quite good, but he, you know, he had the humility enough to be like, <laughs> like, oh, you're listening to what on repeat? I, that's flattering. But here, have you ever heard Miles Davis? Have you ever heard mm -hmm. Cannonball Alley? Have you ever heard Clifford Brown, Max Roach? You know, so he was responsible for, like, single-handedly. I would say Chris is responsible for me playing music at all, and also educating me on jazz, jazz drumming. And, and also just other important jazz players over the years. So I got, you know, probably the first stuff that I got my ears on, that, um, you know, from the, the greater jazz repertoire was like Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, mm. Clifford Brown and Max Roach, the, the, the self-titled album, um, you know, uh, Milestones. It's like actually one of the first CDs I bought with my own money. I found it for like five bucks and it's, I lived across the street from Streetlight Records in San Jose. Um, so, yeah, I just started a little, you know, I was like 10 years old. I started this little jazz CD collection. And mm. those three albums, I would say, are like etched into my my oral memory. 
Mm -hmm. um, and, and definitely form a good part of my imprint of how I, you know, how I wanted to hear jazz music as I started playing it more and learning, you know, the, you know, respectively Art Blakey, Philly Joe Jones, and, um, and Max Roach, you know, just listening to those on repeat so much. Their styles were kind of a template for me. And right. Chris's style as a drummer too, which is informed by all sorts of things. But um, yeah, so I mean, and then you asked about, you know, to fast forward a little bit, I, you asked about the vibraphone. I, I, I played mallets in high school a little bit, um, but not, not a whole lot. I also played saxophone for a while in middle school and high school but it was i only played saxophone because chris specifically told me not to play drums in school band because he knew how bad drummers were treated <laughs> and he was like i was like they got banned at my new at my middle school i'm gonna join the band i'm gonna play the drums in the band just like you and he's like don't do that <laughs> really yeah chris chris like really navigated some stuff for me i'm also left-handed and so is he and he came from the era where it was like oh lefties are everything's backwards so they set the kid up around backwards for lefties and i saw him play i didn't even know that was a backwards kit i was just like well chris plays like this and i'm left-handed so i'm gonna play like this and he's like no you're not and he's just like play the drums the way everyone else does like you don't really? want to be that guy yeah he was like you don't want to be that guy that goes to a jam session it's like hey man can i sit in i just gotta flip all your stuff around really quick you know and it's like it's but, it's really a pain in the butt you know but, there's some people who do it and they, right, they, right. they deal with it but if you can avoid it from the start, where I was a beginner, he was just like, just don't, don't do that, you know. Well, that's interesting because I'm left-handed. Yeah. And I, I, uh, when I learned how to play golf, I played golf right-handed. I didn't even know that they had left-handed golf clubs. Oh. And so by the time I found out that they had left-handed golf clubs, I had already learned how to play with my right hand. I was not about to start over again. Yeah, you know, so uh, yeah, it, that, that's really interesting. I didn't know that the drum styles, but I guess I could see it now that the drum styles would be set. The drums would be set up different for a left-handed person than it would be for a right-handed person, and it just seems like we always get the bad deal. You know, you're <laughs> odd because you're left-handed. No, yeah. I'm special because I'm left-handed. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, what got you to the vibes? Drums to vibes. A heck yeah, of a transition. So so in high school, I had a great percussion teacher who um, was a really wonderful mallet player herself. And um, we would hang out after school and the very small group of us that really liked percussion, she would give a little extra help too. So she's the one that first showed me how to hold four mallets. And I wasn't like a big mallet player, but I found that interesting. So I learned that there's three different types of grips actually that are common. So I learned all of them from her just in a basic, sense i wasn't like an expert in any of them but i just kind of dabbling going okay this you can do this and it looks kind of hard but it's not that hard once you get your hands right. her name's uh shauna alexander and, you know in case she ever watches this i'd love to give her a shout out <laughs> um, she was very important to my musical education and, and later in high school and then when i got to community college um we had these classes where we would just perform in for each other in front of the class and it was kind of interesting because it was a community college, wasn't a super big music program. Normally at big conservatories, they have like cello studio, percussion studio, piano studio, whatever. This was just like studio class. It was called Applied Music. And they had everyone there, like jazz, classical, vocalists, instrumentalists, everybody who was a music major was in that class and performed, which is really also very interesting for me because I got to hear our very classically trained teacher give feedback to all sorts of people and all sorts of stuff that he admitted he didn't know a whole lot about but he just had a overall musical perspective that he offered so my friends were all playing jazz as was i playing drums but none of the guitarists and pianists there wanted to play jazz they were all classical people and they were all really intimidated by jazz and some of the people knew i could hold four mallets they'd see me dabble on the vibraphone i was really not very good like i was really had no idea what i was doing but they uh, my fellow students and friends were like, hey, I'm, I'm playing this song for my recital. Like, can you, could you just play like thirds and sevenths or something on the vibraphone? Like, I know you play. I was like, oh, okay, you know, and I was taking music <laughs> theory. I had the technique. I was like, I know what jazz is supposed to sound like. I could figure this out, you know. Um, so it started actually out of a necessity to, to accompany my friends 
Um, and then they'd be like, take a solo. I was like, ah, and they sounded like a <laughs> toddler that had never played music before. Mm-hmm. You know? It's like, ah, ah. Um, so that was my humble beginnings <laughs> on the mallets. And at that point, I mean, it was like 18 years old. I was already a professional drummer, like playing gigs for money and driving all over the Bay Area. And I'm sitting here, I'm like a beginning vibraphone player. And it was actually very embarrassing at first, but I just, something encouraged me to stick with it. I don't really know what in particular, but um, I was fascinated by the sound of the instrument, the feel of it. You know, there's actually a lot that crosses over from the drums. It's it's also its own bag, you know, that, that like technique wise, if you get into the finite details, it's completely different than, than playing a drum set. You don't have any rebound. You have to lift and control every single stroke. Um, it actually takes a lot more muscular uh, control. Oh, no, okay. The two mallets in one hand, it's very heavy. So it's like a totally different set of muscles, the rotation of it and the, the lack of rebound, you know, so some of it crosses over and some of it doesn't. But good rhythm and good time is, is good rhythm and good time. So I did have that going for me. And for the longest time, I would take these like just janky kind of one or two note solos, you know, just kind of riffing on the, on a note on the blues, on just playing, mm-hmm. the group, you know, with some interesting rhythms. And I don't know, that was interesting enough to the people I was playing with that they encouraged me to keep practicing and learning. Um, yeah, so, you know, fast forward, you know, a little further, I, I was studying with Jason Lewis, who's a great drum, a drum set player. I don't know if Jason's ever come through the Peacock Lounge with anyone over there. Um, but we were doing alternating weeks, one week on drum set and one week on vibraphone. He's actually a great vibraphonist, and he doesn't tell anyone. He keeps it all secret in his attic. He just shreds up there, but no one would ever know. But he's really good. And so he was teaching me that for a while, and then after a while he was like, okay, you need to find someone who really does just vibraphone as their main thing. So he hooked me up with um, Christian Tambor, who's a great vibraphonist. We did some lessons for three years, I think. Mm -hmm. Christian taught me all about playing the blues, which I think was incredibly formative for me, Um, which is ironically not something I was really getting hands-on in school even though I was at like a jazz conservatory. Um, I was studying at the California Jazz Conservatory. I, we got a very big historical lesson on the importance of the blues. I understood that um, almost more conceptually than I did hands-on wise. And I play a solo for Christian and he would just laugh at me. He's like, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> I, I, I kind of needed that. You know, I needed someone to just be like, you don't, like, who are your favorite players? I'm like, Cannonball Adderley and Clifford Brown and all these people. He's like, you don't sound anything like them. You know, have you ever tried transcribing? Have you ever tried listening? It's like, no, yeah, I haven't done that. So, um, you know, he got me on that path of like really deep listening to the tradition and understanding what it means to play by ear and, and get <clears throat> vocal inflection out of the vibraphone. I would say no small part of my interest in the vibraphone too um, I never connected with him personally, but around that time when I graduated high school and was getting into mallets, um, Stefan Harris had joined the SF Jazz Collective. And somewhere around 2009, 2010, they did a whole tribute uh, to Stevie Wonder. Mm-hmm. Where there's this insane arrangement of superstition that is just the craziest thing you've ever heard in your life. And it was Miguel Zanon's, like, you know brainiac kind of crazy stuff you know and um, I just remember this really cool video that they made they're all just like huddled in a circle in one room like a very small room it's a really cool video you can still find it on YouTube SF Jazz Collective playing Superstition Um, and there's a big like two and a half minute featured like vibraphone solo in the middle of the tune and that was my first time hearing Stefan Harris I was like who is this oh my god like I was watching him he was only playing with two mallets, but he was singing while he was playing. He was rolling and doing all this pitch bending and all of, all this stuff to manipulate. <laughs> I often refer to the vibraphone as a hunk of junk. You know, like it's a it's a typewriter. It's like a glorified typewriter. <laughs> you know, meaning it's hard to make that thing sound um, interesting. It's easy to make it sound good enough. It's like oh, it's pretty. You know, but if you want to really sound like you're saying something, it takes a great deal of energy and effort and intention and practice. And so I saw Stefan doing it and I was like, oh, 
like, like that was kind of similar to my, um, you know, being a young aspiring drummer and watching Chris and going, I want to do that. I saw Stefan in that video. And I was like, something about that speaks to me. And that, that really kept me going, actually. Um, it was something I had to explore there. But yeah, and you know, so I, I was at the California Jazz Conservatory from 2011 to 2017, um, just studying with all kinds of different people, all kinds of different music, many different instruments. and. Um, and uh, yeah, and then from there, I just kind of, I've been doing several things as a leader and a side man ever since. But anyway, that's a <laughs> that's a not so short summary. I guess I. Can really <laughs> that's yeah. fine. That's great. You know, um, when I was listening to you, I was extremely impressed. Um, always a Bobby Hutchison fan. Always was, uh, you know, even though it was a little bit before my time, I was really grooving off of like Milt Jackson and cats like that. So uh, later on in your development and really getting this down, did they or those particular musicians have any influence on, on, on your playing? Absolutely, yeah. It, when I was doing lessons with Jason Lewis, as I was talking about, one of his first things for me to check out was uh, he's like transcribe a chorus of Will Jackson, you know? And we started looking at, at the way he combined you know, really bluesy vocabulary with, you know, slightly more advanced harmonic things and did it so elegantly and so rhythmically interesting. Um, yeah, I, I would say Milt's, I mean, Milt is like, I know Lionel Hampton's kind of the godfather of the whole thing, but Milt's approach is definitely like a, a marking point for, you know, you wouldn't have any of uh, any of the things you see nowadays on the vibraphone without Milt Jackson. I mean, his his style, what he did with the motor, he slowed the motor down, it was a little slower, a little sexier, um, more expressive. Um, he was the one that started doing a lot more of those kind of like bendy rolls and things like mm -hmm. that, um, and really getting a more vocal tone, you know, like really sounded like he was singing on the instrument. Even though I don't, if you watch videos and stuff, he's not, He's not actually singing like the way Stefan Harris or some of these people are. Um, a lot of these older guys like actually had the discipline to keep their mouths shut, but still play like they were singing. <laughs> and now everyone's like, it's all holistic, you know. Now just just sing, man, just sing. And my brother's a sound engineer. He's like, you he generally mic the vibes with two overheads, like right mm -hmm. here, which may as well be freaking vocal mics, right? So when I when I start singing when I'm playing, he's always like, "Man, you sound so good, but you got to stop that singing bullshit." And I just, he always tells me to <laughs> shut up. <laughs> and I'm like, well, "Stefan does it." And it's like, "Yeah, no, it doesn't. It doesn't matter." Um, <laughs> but yeah, Milt Jackson was deeply influential for me once I started really studying the history of the instrument and um, and taking that seriously. And I found Bobby later. It wasn't intentionally a chronological thing, like a study of the players, but I just kind of found his music later, but uh, yeah, he's Bobby Hutcherson um, is definitely also like standalone, like singular approach to I'd say music in general. It's not even just about the vibraphone, you know. He was a tremendous improviser and a tremendous band leader, and he understood how to move a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. um, I only got to see him once, unfortunately, before he passed, and he was in really poor health and had like an oxygen tank and. He was he was mm. sitting on the stool playing like nobody plays the vibe sitting down really but he had to just have a stool up there but I'll never forget it was at the Kumba and he played at one point in the middle of the show he played a medley of three different ballads I don't remember exactly what they were but he strung them all together like really masterfully and barely played the melodies like maybe didn't even play all the notes of the melodies like left a lot of it out it was very spacious and I was watching me he couldn't play much physically. But what he did play, ha still, even though he was so physically unwell, it still had every person on the edge of their seat, like just, you know, totally engulfed in what, you know, his spirit and his decision making process in the moment, where he was going to go, what he was going to play or not play. Um, that, that was profoundly um, moving and informative to me. I wish I could have spent more time seeing him live, but yeah. You know, the, I've, uh, I love this music and 
there was always a sound, the sound on the vibe that intrigued me, that I just really said, wow, this is it. And for me, you know, Milt Jackson, as you said, or Lionel Hampton, you know, I didn't really get into it till it was Bobby. You know, Milk Jackson kind of, Lionel was more of the big band things and I, I uh, excuse me, wasn't at that time really into the big band. I was just learning this music, so I'm listening to the quartets, quintets, and you know, the collaboration of them. And listening to Bobby Hutchison, because to tell you the truth, he was my first and really involved. Then there was a few others, like you said, Stephen Harris, uh, uh, Ricky Kelly, who was really well known in the Los Angeles area. So I just feel that that vibe has a rich, can I say this, just has a really rich feel to yeah. the music of jazz. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's an interesting, you know, being like a vibraphonist is such an interesting thing because you wheel that thing around on the street or you play it somewhere and people just are confronted by like, whoa, what is this? thing and half people have no idea what it is never seen it before they don't even you say it's a vibraphone they're just like what like is it like a xylophone and that's like at least half maybe more <laughs> like that and then the other half have some vague associations with it a lot of them about jazz uh some of them not with jazz at all some people are like can you play the mr rogers theme and like I think that's a celeste i don't know like you know <laughs> just like stuff like that it, it's like I, i've struggled with that instrument for so long because it has such a like kitschy association with it and the last thing i want is to be associated with some like you know you know you don't see me putting on a three-piece suit and playing like a 1920s themed throwback trad jazz party it's not the kind of music i do and when people project that onto me because I play the vibes, I'm always like, what are you hearing? Are you listening to what I'm doing? Because it's not, it's not that, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but I get that a lot, actually. It's kind of, and it's just because I play the vibraphone. It has nothing to do with the music I'm making or what. And so you just have to learn to smile and nod. And like, I'm I, genuinely like if somebody's digging <clears throat> the music at all and they say some weird stuff about it that's pretty ill-informed, I'm just like, I'm so glad they were listening, you know, like, it's just, I'll just take that, you know, over anything else. Not Nobody's got to be an expert, you know. Well, you know, that's interesting because I, I never felt like that. And I didn't know that there was that type of, uh, I shouldn't say pushback, but that kind of uh, obstacle course that they, you or how they describe the vibe, of the, you know, the vibes. And uh, man, I never, I don't even see it like that. I just look at another great instrument that how it's, it just hits this old, you know, great classical American classical art form. Yeah, yeah. And and I love the sounds of them. You know, so I'm just really kind of tripping right now when you're talking about all what people are saying this and that about it. I don't see that. Yeah. You know, I, I don't I see, see that. a disproportionate amount of it being the guy lugging a vibraphone around. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> well, it could be, but I'm telling yeah. you, man, it has a sound that, because you truly, truly, and I'm not exaggerating, I'm not trying to fill your head up, but you truly, truly invest, uh, invest. you truly, truly uh, had me interested, man. I was really enjoying your sound and yeah. how you, and I, I noticed how, you know, you were kind of coaching Skyler, you know, in different things, because this is her first time as a leader. Mm -hmm. and so I know she was really happy about that, but it just seemed like you two really played off of each other pretty well. Yeah, that came together really nicely. You know, yes. It was a nice opportunity to be able to, because we had just, her and I had only played together in the context of Marcus Shelby's big band. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Which was also really fun and very cool, but it's, you know, the individual contributions of each member are more limited to serve the, you know it's a giant group you have to play your part and mm -hmm. it's very well thought out you know um so it was cool to play in a small group with her and just have kind of dialogue and she's so amazing i mean i was so blown away just like how quickly she like learned some of the tunes that i brought and took very coherent and and engaging solos immediately you know it was just like every single line she played was just like perfect I'm just like, yeah. yeah she's incredible I'm, she's I'm really, really she truly is 
Um, playing the drums and also playing the vibes. Is there a preference that you'd like to do more drums or vibes? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I depending on my schedule, I might alternate like like kind of one way or another for a week or two. I might just have a lot of stuff on the vibes, and then you know I have a lot of stuff. Like the last two months, I would say I've had way more gigs on drums, and I've just 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 how the how the bookings have come in and the, the calendar looked, you know. So I have to devote more time to practicing to stay sharp in that, and then inevitably, you know, my vibraphone playing suffers a little bit and I have to you know and the same thing happens in reverse you know I'll have two weeks of like gigs with my new band Heart Matter or something like that and then you know some really hard gig on the drums and I'll sit down to practice and go like I feel like I forgot how to play you know mm. temporarily it always mm -hmm. comes back but you know I've just learned to make peace with that that it's just this con you can't I personally I can't keep them both at my sharpest edge at all times as much as I'd like to I just I can't do that. That they they always alternate like this, and then you know I push the level ahead over time. My edge gets in, you know sharpened, but in the moment they kind of go back and forth. But I enjoy different things about them. I I think I think why I've stuck with playing the vibes um, against <laughs> my better judgments. Um, it's it's been really cool to have. A percussive based um, access point to melodic um, improvisation melodic creation you know um, and that's something that I don't get from the drums as much I mean it's like you can play melodies on the drums and things yeah but it's not it's not like playing the actual notes of the melody you know like mm -hmm. especially the chromaticism um, that's inherent in both I would say the blues and jazz um, it's an incredibly chromatic um, art form. And uh, it's been really rewarding for me to both play the piano and the vibraphone um, re relentlessly for the last 15 years. Um, and all of that makes me a better drummer. And my drumming makes me a better vibes player. It's, it's circular, you know. So I, I see it as both kind of feeding each other. and. This is another, not to kind of uh, overemphasize Stefan Harris too much, but another quote of his that I appreciate from an interview that he gave was, he, he discussed kind of a moment in his life where he stopped seeing himself as a vibraphonist, and he stopped seeing himself as even, um, even a jazz musician. And he described the freedom in that, and he was kind of joking about like, he's like, why is it that when we talk about um, you know, instruments and musicians that we're always talking about, like the, it's like the instrument's like a tool that the person uses to express something. It's like, but we don't talk about writers that way. You know, it's like if you're a novelist or something, like we don't say like, are you a pen writer or a pencil writer? Are you a typewriter? Are you a that's true, writer? right? You know, right, it's like true. you just you made this novel and we like it. You know, and it's great. However, you know, probably some combination of scratch notes on bar napkins and nice notebooks and Google Docs and whatever and it turns into something that we can then enjoy as a final product so I've been really kind of shifting my mindset to think of myself more as someone who has a, a gift with regard to participating hands-on with with the structures that make music mm -hmm. in, in general so I'm playing the bass a lot lately I'm playing piano a lot I'm playing vibraphone and drums you know professionally out in public but behind the scenes I'm playing all kinds of stuff I'm getting into recording and mixing and mastering and that kind of stuff um, just like music is the underlying um, exactly all exactly. that right, right and right. I think it's been really cool for <clears> me to have a circular relationship between sort of a rhythm section focus thing and a more like you know front man soloist melody player thing with the vibes and being able to alternate those roles like multiple times even in one day sometimes you know mm -hmm. and not you know i used to feel really kind of like jerked around by that and now i don't it's just that's cool it's just all about in service of the music and i just do whatever my my um whatever becomes apparent my role is in any given moment that's mm -hmm. what i try to offer you know you know um a lot of people that will be listening to this interview 
and say, man, I really like to hear your music or even get some of your music. What's the best way for them to be able to do that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I have the only official record I have out is of a band that I, I sent you in the email. There's this band that I had called Neverweather. Um, mm -hmm. So you can, and, and it's tricky because my name isn't technically associated with it. It's just Neverweather. Um, our album came out in 2020 uh, and it, it's called Blissonance. Um, and all of that music is written for a quintet, drums, electric guitar, upright bass, trumpet, and alto sax. And um, I'm, I'm composed all the music and, you know, it's kind of the band leader behind the drum set sort of vibe. So I, I'm really proud of that record that admittedly that band doesn't play anymore, that everyone has since like moved all over the world at, from the pandemic kind of dispersed us yeah. elsewhere. But um, I'm, I'm glad we made that record for that reason, because it documented a good four year journey or so with that band. Mm -hmm. It's pretty unique music, I think. Um, it's sort of informed by various like influences of mine from like sort of prog rock background in high school and things like that and also like some avant-garde improvisational elements um, we have this one song called more beak which for instance just starts at the top and we, we all play this unison melody together and then there's three pages of melodic material and harmony and things and the rule is like anybody after that opening melody anyone can play any part <laughs> at any tempo at any time that they wish and you can join someone or counter them or whatever so we have these kind of musical games but it, it doesn't read that way when you're listening to it, it just sounds like music you know but mm -hmm. um, so yeah never weather is uh, never weather has an album called blissonance that's really wonderful you can find that on all the streaming platforms and everything um i admittedly don't have anything out as a vibraphonist band leader and I'm trying to kind of work on that um, so I can't point to anything instrumentally like that okay. but what I will point to is I have a new band that's called Heart Matter and Heart Matter is a quartet led by myself on vibraphone and my good friend Amy D who's a singer and um, yeah we Amy and I co-write all the music and, and co-lead that band and um, we have Isaac Schwartz who plays drums and, and our friend Lucas Vesely plays the bass. Well, Isaac Schwartz, not to cut you off, Isaac Schwartz is going to be at the Peacock Lounge on the 7th of June. That's right. He was telling me about that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, Isaac is the busiest cat in, the, in town. <laughs> he's like plays all over the place. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he's an amazing drummer. And, and Lucas is also just absolute virtuoso electric bass player. And, um, we're really lucky to have both them participating in the band uh, that that band has now a website um, instagram page and youtube channel and a patreon so you can find us just about everywhere looking for heart matter sounds so heartmattersounds.com um at heart matter sounds on instagram and i th i think our youtube channel is also called heart matter sounds um so we have a few videos from our live shows uh, on our YouTube channel that are, that are pretty high quality. I actually mixed them myself and multiple cameras and that kind of stuff. Um, and we have a, a studio video shoot that we did um, where we have we have four tunes and we're it's secret. It's not so secret. So we're slowly releasing those four. We just released our first single from that studio session, which is called Horizons. And you can find that on Bandcamp. Um, so if anybody's curious about my vibraphone playing in particular, looking up stuff about heart matter would be the best way to kind of see the, the most well-documented, um, evidence I have of that. But I would love to do a trio record. I, I played, um, in February, I got to play with one of my heroes. Are you familiar with the band, The Bad Plus? I've heard of them. Yeah. yeah that's a trio. Um, that, well, they started as a piano trio for 17 years with the same members. They were like really core group people. But uh, the drummer of the Bad Plus is a guy named Dave King, and he's a personal hero of mine. And um, we became close over the last five or six years. And long story short, I asked him to play with me and we did two shows in February. Um, 
and uh, my friend Kanoa Mendenhall, who's a really wonderful bassist, um, came out from New York to join us on those couple of dates. So I do have some recordings from our second gig and some video of that show, and I'm hoping to share one or two mm -hmm. songs from that show, but I'm just get, kind of moving slow on the mixing and editing and stuff because I'm, I'm never home. <laughs> I'm just like running around all the time. Little shameless plug, uh, Heart Matter is playing uh, I'm doing a birthday show in August. I'm a, I'm a Virgo. So August 26th. So am I. Are September you? 6th. All right. On. Left handed Virgo. What does that I'm tell you? That. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah. So August 26th is my birthday. Uh, on the 25th, we're going to play a show at Keys Jazz Bistro, which is in North Beach. And um, I'd love to encourage anyone who's interested in my music to come check that out. This band is sounding really, really good. Um, we're in this weird spot because it's like, you know, as you were, we were talking about earlier, it's like we don't have we don't have a record out, right? It's a fairly new band, about two years old, and we've been focused mostly on writing material and rehearsing to get it tight on stage. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like, you know, other than the handful of live videos we have are actually kind of old at this point, you know, because we've developed so much. So it's sort of like people have to take my word for it. Um, and if you take my word for it, this band is very good and, and we're doing something that I think is pretty unique um, and doing it at a very high level. So um, the good news is like, we have more original material than we have time to play it in a show. We have to pick and choose between our catalog of like, okay, what kind of a set are we crafting which is a great problem to have for a new band i was about to say it is yeah i mean we have so, we're approaching you know somewhere around 30 songs or so uh, which is kind of unbelievable to even say out loud but um uh we've filled out some grant proposals and things like that we're trying to get in the studio hopefully in the fall and at least cut a little ep if not a full-length record but budget is the biggest um, limiting factor with that. Isn't stuff. that always a problem? Yep, this just is what it is. It's part of the reason I've been getting into like mixing and audio engineering um, is I think one of my goals over time is to put some of the means of production into my own hands so that I can be more in flow with having a musical idea and documenting it and just getting it going rather than like, okay, how do I crowdfund $5,000 to pay a band out and get into the studio and pay the engineer and rent this time and you know, go like, okay, okay, let's do my own thing here and there. But um, yeah, so August 25th, Heart Matters playing at Keys Jazz Bistro. And another thing adjacent to that, I will say, it's been very cool for me, a um, really wonderful opportunity. I haven't actually publicized this properly yet. I was, I'm going to kind of do more of a press release and more of a big thing in the fall to sort of draw some attention to it. But um, Simon Rowe, the uh, owner of Keys Jazz Bistro, he's a great organist and, and pianist. Um, he has offered me a once a month slot over at Keys to basically do as I please, which is very cool. And um, so Heart Matters coming in, you know, on sort of a four month, maybe four or five month rotation, you know. Oh, okay. Um, we played, you know, earlier this month and then we'll be back, you know, in, at the end of August so that's almost four months um, and uh, but once a month I, I'm bringing different groups there um, and it's a it's a really mixed bag it's some bands I play in as a sideman that I think deserve a bigger platform and a more proper listening room um, a lot of bands I've been drumming in um, it's some new things altogether um, like on June 6th I'll be there um, if you happen to be in town, I know you're, you're leading the show on the 7th at the Peacock Lounge, but if you're around, um, I'm leading a group on the drums that is going to be, it's a, it's a brand new band, but it's a, it's like a composer collective with four of us all writing tunes and playing each other's music. Um, and that was fun. We just got together two months ago just for fun, like just Darren Johnston, the trumpet player hit us up and said hey you guys want to do a session i'm free on the state cool they came to my studio i set up some mics just because i was like why not you know mm -hmm. 
we were because we were reading down some originals of of the guitarist Kai Lyons and Rob Ewing's the bass player, who's also a great trombonist. Um, we were reading some originals by all these guys that that were brand new, like they didn't have any documentation of them. It's like, well, we've got a band full of good readers and good improvisers. Like, let's just hit record and see what see happens. What yeah. yeah. So we played, and it was like, this kind of sounds really good. Like first try, <laughs> you know. And uh, yeah, then I got the slot with with Simon over there, and so I hit them up. I was like, man, I got this date. You guys free and interested? You want to like not to be like asking somebody out on the first date or whatever, you know? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. are we a band now? You know? <laughs> but uh, but we kind of did that, and we're we're calling the band Swerve Control, and <laughs> that's gonna be me. Interesting and, title. Yeah, it was me on drums, Darren Johnston on trumpet. Um, Kai Lyons, amazing guitar player, uh, and Rob Ewing on electric bass, and all four of us are composing for the group. Um, so, like, I get the opportunity to do things like that at Keys, which is really special. And um, in the future, I plan on bringing back different iterations of my Vibes Trio with different members um, playing with me. Um, I also I used to do this thing that we called Beyond Words Jazz and Poetry that was. Um, We'd have three or four poets come and, and a small band, usually two or three musicians, mm -hmm. including myself. And uh, we would do completely free improvisation to the poetry. And we could do a whole night of music like that. Um, I haven't done that in a few years, but it was something really special I enjoyed doing. So I think in North Beach, that would be perfect. You know, like, right, we're one block away from City Lights, you know, and all right, this. Right, exactly. Uh, Jack Kerouac, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, yeah, like all, all this kind of history in that neighborhood. I think that would be a, a cool thing. So, yeah, once a month I'll be playing a key. I don't have, it's not like second Thursdays or something like that. It's just kind of, I get a slot right, to right. date. But um, but you can follow, you know, Keys Jazz Bistro online. Go to their website and their calendar and just look for my name on the calendar and you'll see me there once a month with all kinds of really interesting groups. And I plan on keeping that going for a little while. So... Very yeah. cool. Very cool. Dylan, thank you so much for your time, man. Enjoyed yeah. this conversation. Yeah. Looking forward to you playing at the Peacock Lounge. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We'd love that. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So, continued success to you, man. Uh, like I said, you know, you're rocking the Bay Area. I'm loving it. Let's stay in touch. And uh, definitely, you got to make it to the Peacock Lounge, bro. Okay, I'd love, yeah, yeah. love that. Yeah, I'd love that. My name is James Graves. This is Night Journey Rewind, the podcast. And we were visiting with my man, Dylan. Uh, I have a phonist and also a drummer. This cat is bad. If you see him, truly, truly check him out. The boy is bad. Let me just put it that way. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, man. Thank